Amen. 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 Welcome, family. <laughs> Thank you for joining us once again. Um, we're so grateful, so privileged to have you all here with us. So last week, um, we did a, the first part of the series and we talked extensively from the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. And we spent the bulk of our time on Luke 24, especially within um, verse 30 to 34 and part of 35 as well. So, and we had an assignment to actually read 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 32 for this um, series, for today's session. Now, while pre preparing, I realized that it would be just too much to talk about all those verses. So I decided to split it. So today our emphasis would be on 1 Corinthians 11 from 17 to 28, then, Part three of it will pick up from verse 28 and um, go all the way to verse 32. Now the goal is to help us understand. We are not just doing a preaching, we're doing a teaching and verse by verse, if possible, word by word, because we want these principles to be part of your life. You know, we want it to be your lifestyle in everything that you do. And so in order for that to become your reality, we believe that teaching is a good vehicle to help expound on on it amen on our behalf so we will actually read and first corinthians 11 17 to 32 we'll read everything but of course the bulk of our time will be spent within 17 to 28 and most especially 22 to 28 amen so mm -hmm. buckle up we are about to start <laughs> and you know how it goes here we build up and uh, we need to be attentive and uh, we need to understand we are very passionate about understanding. It, it doesn't benefit anybody when you say too much and nothing is understood. And that is why we take time to break it down so that even the simplest amongst us will understand. Mm -hmm. Now, here we go. First Corinthians 11, 17 to 22. NIV version says, um, that portion talks about correcting an abuse of the Lord's Supper. The book of Corinthians history holds that it was written by the apostle Paul. He was at Ephesus when he wrote first Corinthians, amen. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he wrote to them is because he couldn't get to them on time to correct the, the issues that the church was experiencing during that season. So he had to write to them. He had established this church, but he got received news that there was some chaos going on there. And part of it was how they, they handled the, the activities of the Lord's Supper or the ceremony of the Lord's Supper. So he wrote to them amongst many things. He wrote to them to correct this aspect. And that is why it is titled Correcting an Abuse of the Lord's Supper. So here we go, NIV version says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He says, for your meetings do more harm than good. Verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. That is Paul speaking. He says, no doubt there have, they have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Clearly, we can see a leader who is displeased with his people. He's really expressing his mind and typically leaders should praise their people. But Paul in this case says, I have no praise for you. We, and we can clearly see that there were too many things going on that he wasn't, um, he did not approve of. Now let's read this same portion, verse 17 to 20, 22 from the expanded Bible, just so that we get a clearer picture of what is happening. It says that in the things instructions, commands, I tell you now, I do not praise you because when you come together, your meetings as when you come together, you, your meetings as a congregation do more harm than good. 
First, I hear that when you meet together as a church, you are divided. There are divisions among you. And I believe some of this. He says, it is necessary to have factions among you so that it may be clear which of you really have um, God's approval. Meaning that controversy is necessary because error must be opposed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, verse 20, he says that when you come together, meaning meet as a congregation, you're not really eating the Lord's Supper. Meaning the worship meal Jesus told his followers to celebrate, to remember his death. Paul says that is not what you're doing, even though you have gathered in the name of partaking of the Lord's Supper. He says that this is because when you eat, each person eats without waiting for the elder, for the others. The wealthy church members were arriving early to avoid sharing with the poorer members. Such social distinctions were common throughout the Greco-Roman world. Some people do not get enough to eat while others have too much to drink, meaning they got drunk in the process for the Lord's Supper. Amazingly, don't you have homes in which to eat and drink or do you despise, have contempt for or have no regard for God's church and so embarrass, humiliate those who are poor, those who have nothing? What shall I tell you? Shall I praise you? I will not praise you for, I will not praise you for doing this. The Corinthians were turning a time meant for unity in one of discrimination. Amen. Amen. You know, unlike Amen. us today, when we go to our fellowship centers, we're being offered, you know, um, juice and bread. In those days, they had the privilege of bringing their wine and bread to church. So others used it as a platform to demonstrate how much they had. Others used it as a platform to come and eat more than they were supposed to. In fact, they just abused the whole ceremony. So Paul totally <laughs> everything they were doing so that is a scene that is what we are dealing with and just like paul corrected that problem then it is a problem worth correcting today and that is the reason why we have gathered here because we want to demystify certain things we want to um, emphasize certain things we want to correct certain things as well using the word of god as our guide now what was happening then we want to look at what was happening then summarily. We, have, we see a displaced leader, you know, so, so upset with everything that is going on. What else was happening? Their meeting together was doing more harm than good. And there were divisions evident in the crowd. Total chaos and division. Error was exposed because based on how the people acted, you could tell who was correct and who was wrong. And also the congregation was not properly celebrating the death of Jesus Christ. They were not. They gathered for something else, even though they thought they were gathering for uh, the purpose of the body, celebrating the death of Jesus Christ. And then what was exercised and expressed? Greed, selfishness, drunkenness. Could you imagine that in the house of God? And then dishonor to God and man, because there was favoritism, there was um, discrimination. They treated the poor poorly, and they gave more um, homage to the rich. Now, that is what happened then. What is happening now? We want to bring it to the now. What is happening now? We, in this dispensation, have a casual approach. Casual approach towards this ceremony. They operated in the way they did, but in this system we have now, we may not necessarily get drunk or show favoritism or discrimination, but we totally do have a casual approach. And the reason mm -hmm. is because we do not understand the why of the body and blood of Jesus and the how of it. Amen. Mm -hmm. And also in this day and age, we practice self-condemnation. Therefore, we deprive ourselves from partaking altogether. What, what do we tell ourselves? I am not worthy enough to take it. Why is that? Because we have misinterpreted that particular verse um, of scripture. Amen. We said we are Amen. not condemn ourselves. Then we don't take it all together. Amen. We think it's only for the righteous. But I'm here to tell us that it is because you're, you're unrighteous. That, you, that is why you need it. And we'll talk about that even more. Amen. Amen. It's because you are unworthy. That is why you need it. You will never get worthy enough to partake of it. It's mm. because you are unworthy. That is why you take it. Mm. Now, what is our problem now? We do not properly discern the body of Jesus Christ. Neither do we properly discern the blood of Jesus. We lump everything together. And we just 
gulp it down, consume it without any understanding. So it is of no effect to us. Now, we do not partake of it as often as we ought to. It is not our lifestyle. We know about it, but we don't practice it like we are supposed to. That is our problem now, and we want to and also another problem that I have identified is that yeah, I mean, my is so huh? as often as they are supposed to. Amen. So as much as we learn about it, the goal is to go and make impact in our communities. Amen. So we continue with the trend of thought from verse 23 through 28. Paul says, after he has rebuked them, you know, he now corrects, he now brings correction of how things should be done. And it's a common practice, that should be a common practice with us. When you tell somebody that do not do it this way, you should be able to tell them how then they should do it. So Paul now goes and says, that, for I received from the Lord, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Right there, you see that Christ is discerning both. He did not lump all of them together and gave it to his disciples. He spoke to each one individually. Amen. Mm -hmm. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. When you drink uh, eat the bread and drink of the cup in an unworthy manner. You are not the unworthy person. It is the manner in which you drink it. He says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of from the cup. And concluding on this thought all the way to verse 34, it says that for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep, meaning dead. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we will not come under such judgment. Verse 32 says, nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat you shall you should all eat together not divided anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together it may not result in judgment and when i come i'll give further directions amen, amen. so we have read the entire portion and the trend of thought now we have spoken very briefly from verse 17 through 22 how he was addressing and rebuking. Now we want to focus on the correction. We will spend the bulk of our time on 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 23 to 28, amen. amen. So now moving on to verse 23, we're going to go verse by verse with these six um, verses listed. Now the Bible says in verse 23 that for I received from the Lord, what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed to bread. I'll read it from the Amplified Classic. It says, for I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you. It was given to me personally that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress to bread. Amen. This is very, very important. First of all, as children of God, we are privileged to walk with the Lord so shall we receive mysteries from him. Amen. When you get saved, there are certain things that you're privileged to know at that time, but there are other things that you get to know only when you pay the price to stay with him. Paul is saying that for I received, meaning I para lambano from the Lord, meaning because I walked side by side with the Lord, this is what he revealed to me. Paul, like you and I, was not privileged to walk with Jesus face to face, but he got to a place where he 
para lambano in Greek walked side by side with God, with Jesus, to a place where the Lord Jesus himself passed on a mystery to him, mm -hmm. a mystery that he was not privileged to be part of when Jesus Christ was on earth. But by virtue of relationship, God unveiled this mystery to him. So he says, I received from the Lord, I para lambano from the Lord, what I passed on to you today. Yes. Amen. Amen. He said it was given to me personally. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is this, what have we received from the Lord personally? Are we only receiving from others or do we pay the price to receive from him directly? Like Paul, I'd like us to copy that example because the mysteries are for the children of God, amen. He's not hiding them from us, he's hiding it for us. He says that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress, took bread, amen. amen. Now, according to the records, I think in Matthew or the book of Luke as well, when you see the chronological order in which the road, um, Judas Iscariot, whom we all know was the person who um, 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 betrayed Jesus Christ, the process had already begun to a place where he had already received 30 pieces of silver and was waiting for an opportune time to deliver Jesus into their hands. So even though he was part of the meal, he had begun a betrayal process. That is why I like going to the Amplified Classic Version, which says that while his betrayal was in progress. So as I meditated on this portion of scripture, the Lord began to unveil to me that, you know what, the, the communion is a way out, it's a bailout system from betrayal. That when you know that you have been betrayed, while your betrayal is in progress, meaning that even while you are being betrayed, there is one thing you can do. Instead of focusing on the betrayal, focus on taking bread. Amen. Amen. Focus on taking bread. Why? Because it is a weapon for us. It is a weapon of warfare for us. You use the bread to fight the enemy. Bread as in the bread um, of, of bread of life, you know, as you partake of the Lord's Supper, and bread as the word of God. Sometimes it could even be you betraying the plans and purposes of God in your life. Mm. But the Lord is saying that when you find yourself betraying the word, what you should do is that catch yourself and take bread yes. so that you can recondition your thought processes and recondition your That's mind. Good. Amen. You can recondition it because our speech most often is the avenue through which we betray the Lord. How are you doing? I'm just hanging. You were not created to hang in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You are the Amen. son of the most high God. When we say things like that, when we use um, our speeches are loose and are not aligning with the word of God, we are betraying the word of God. In times like that, when you are the betrayer in progress, I advise you catch yourself and take the word amen. amen so when jesus's betrayer was in progress he did not focus on the betrayer he focused on the bread amen, amen. he focused on the bread because we, we eventually know what happened to judas iscariot amen. amen he neither used the 30 pieces of silver nor did he stay alive he committed suicide he died he didn't use the money so when we focus on god when we are being betrayed you can be sure that because um, communion is a weapon of warfare, he will fight for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. He will fight for you. This is a, a, a non-confrontational warfare um, um, tool in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we should not waste our energy focusing on our betrayers and uh, and the, the, the betraying process and talking about it. Let's use a weapon that will fight for us. Amen. Amen. Now we go to verse 24, because Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. Then he says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Last time when we spoke from Luke chapter um, 24, 30 to 34, we laid emphasis a lot on the benefits 
of giving thanks when we are about to take partake of this. I really recommend that if you haven't, if you do not watch the first series, please do so. It's going to help a lot with verse 24. We say we give thanks for the bread as the bread of life. And when we give thanks for the bread, we're also giving thanks for Jesus, who is the word that manifests himself, became flesh here on earth. Amen. So it's important because when you give thanks for everything, you're acknowledging the source of it. Amen. It's very important that we give thanks because we acknowledge the source of it. It says, and when he had given thanks, for no other reason, because Jesus gave thanks, we ought to give thanks for the things that we receive. Amen. Mm. Amen. Then we also said that the bread is broken as a symbolic act and a prophetic a prophetic acts as well. We break it because the Bible says that when he had given thanks, he broke it. And we said that this was to symbolize that the body of Jesus was broken, but not his bones. And we went extensively to identify three scriptures that talk about um, a fulfillment of prophecies that his body was broken, not his bones. And we said as a prophetic act in Luke 24, the Bible says that when he sat down with his disciples, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it. The next verse says that the eyes of their understanding opened, and by and at that point they were able to know him. Amen. So we said that prophetically, when you break the bread prior to studying the word of God, your prayer request that says that may my eyes be open, may the eyes of my understanding be open, will be open because communion now serves or the bread specifically serves as a vehicle through which that can become your reality. Amen. It says that this is my body, which is broken. It's very important that when you take that bread, one of the ways to properly discern the bread is to break it. Amen. Now, also, still in this verse 24, it says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. A long time ago, when I meditated on this particular scripture, the Lord told me that, Mildred, this is your solution to forgetfulness. If you will remember me often, then I can take care of your memory problem. Amazingly, yesterday, I was just doing a, a research and I um, searching online, I saw a research that supports the fact that when we worship the Lord often, we have neurophysiological benefits to it. So it just went a long way to confirm what the Lord had been telling me many uh, months ago, that when I remember him often, he can take care of my memory. Amen. The neurons of my brain can be rejuvenated as I spend time focusing on this particular act of worship. So too, for students on the line and for everybody, if you desire to have a sharp memory, if you desire to be able to, to remember things quickly when you're told and to not be forgetful in your ways, this is a good way, this is a good tool to take care of it. And besides, how often, you know, in a day we have 24 hours, we have 1,440 minutes in a day. How often within those minutes do you remember God? Honestly, how often within those hours and minutes do you really remember God? He knew that, so he made provisions for it, amen? He made provisions for your remembrance. So use it as a way of remembering him often. Now the Bible says that in the same way after supper, we see the lifestyle coming up. It was within a supper setting, amen? Not necessarily in a cathedral or a tabernacle and all of that. After supper, he took the cup. Now he had discerned the body. Now he's discerning the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, amen? He talked about new covenant because there is an old covenant, amen. So when you hold the bread or the juice in your hand, you want to be reminded, go through your mind, try to understand what indeed is that new covenant and what is in it for me, amen. As you remember and go through what the new covenant is and what the benefits are in it for you, you are properly discerning the blood of Jesus Christ, amen, before partaking. Remember, we are saying that you cannot join everything together and just partake because even Jesus himself did not do that. So we should not do it, amen. And we are giving us reasons why we shouldn't do it. Now, 
the Bible says that as often as you drink of this cup or whenever you drink it, you do so in remembrance of me. So partaking, of course, of the Lord's Supper takes care of memory problems. It helps you in your, your lifestyle, helps you to remember Jesus Christ as many times within those 1,440 minutes a day or more. Amen. So he says that this is the cup of um, the new covenant in my blood. Now, subsequently, we are going to receive um, um, teachings on the blood of Jesus so that it will help us really appreciate the blood of Jesus, just like we are appreciating his body. But today, just because I don't want to brush through it, I just want to highlight to us four benefits of the blood of Jesus that can keep us as we properly discern his blood during the communion. Amen. Now, I'll, I'll um, extrapolate three benefits from uh, Romans chapter 3, 24 to 25, and I'll use another scripture for the next benefit. Romans 3, 24 to 25, I'm reading to you from the New King James Version all the way to 25a. It says, being justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So there are three things that are happening here, all because of the blood of Jesus, justification, redemption, and propitiation. Let's look at the Amplified Classic version even better. It's going to explain it to us even better. It says, all are justified, meaning you and I, everybody are justified and made upright and in right standing with God. How? Freely and gratuitously by his grace. So we are justified. We are made in right standing because of what? The, his grace. And what is this grace? His unmerited favor and mercy. How? How is this justification a reality? It is through the redemption, which is provided in Christ Jesus. Amen. Meaning it is not by yourself, personal effort. It is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward before the eyes of all as a mercy seat and propitiation. How? By his blood, the cleansing and life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation to be received, how? Through faith. Meaning that for you to say that I am justified, for you to say that I am redeemed, for you to say that uh, I've been atoned for or there's propitiation, amen, it is by faith, amen, and it is through the blood of Jesus, and that blood came from Jesus Christ himself, meaning that all of this cannot be achieved by your personal effort. So as I meditated on this particular verse, I thought I should put it in a chat format so that I can help even the simplest amongst us to understand. There are too many words going on there, but what are they saying at the end? It's not important to just read, 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 read and never get an understanding. Now, like we said, we are discerning the blood of Jesus, meaning that when you hold the cup, what are you saying? This is the blood of Jesus, the blood of the new covenant. Why new covenant? Because there was an old covenant. In that old covenant, the, the blood of bulls and animals was the blood that was speaking on our behalf. But in this new covenant, we have the blood of Jesus that is speaking on our behalf. In the old covenant, sacrifices had to be made annually, but Jesus Christ in the new covenant is the one and last final sacrifice, amen. So you begin to see the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. Old covenant was annual by animals. The new covenant is once done by Jesus Christ. But what is in it for us? That is what we want to find out so that we can properly appreciate this blood. Amen. Now, there are three things in that verse which I'll explain without necessarily reading the verse. Let me begin from the aspect of propitiation. Please just follow very closely on the screen. When the Bible says propitiation, it's simply saying that um, the wrath of God has been appeased. Propitiation simply means to appease wrath. In the context we are speaking, we are talking about God's wrath being appeased towards us. Why? Because once upon a time, okay, 
sin, we were very close to God, but because of sin, our relationship with him was strained. It created a gap and God does not like sin. So that kept him away from us. But because he loves us so much, he had to make provisions for that to bridge that gap. Otherwise, he will always be angry with us, but he does not want to be angry with us, okay? So he sent Jesus Christ. He said, you know what? Come, die, present your blood so that when I see your blood, my wrath will be appeased. I will no longer be angry with the people that I created. Amen. So propitiation is by his blood and through faith only. Amen. By his blood and through faith only. Through faith Amen. only. Mean? We mean that you and I should get to a place where we are comfortable saying that, you know what, God is no longer angry with me. And rightfully so, he is no longer angry with you. So all this talk of, you know, God is angry with me and all of that, it's not true because provisions have been made for that. Amen. Provisions have been made and you, are, you cannot do anything for God to be happy with you by your own effort. Somebody paid the price. It is because of that price that God is happy with you. Now you can boldly come before him, run to him as Abba Father, because he loves you and there is a relationship between both of you. So when you do wrong and stay away from God saying that he's angry with you, it's a trick of the enemy to keep you from a relationship that somebody sacrificed for you to have. So by faith, believe and receive these benefits of the blood. So when you hold this cup, you say, Father, this breached the gap between you and me. You are no longer angry with me. I can never see you getting angry with me. You do not plan to get angry with me because a blood is advocating for that. Amen. What do we mean by redemption? When God created man, there was a place that God placed man in. But because of sin, sin moved man from point A to maybe point Z. And when God came to find man in point A, God could not find man. Man had been displaced because of sin. And when he was displaced, he became a lawful captive to sin. Amen. So because of the blood, the blood was a payment to purchase us from captivity into freedom. So when we say redemption, we are simply saying that a payment was, was made to purchase us from captivity into freedom, meaning Amen. that a payment was made to move us from where we do not have to be to a place where we ought to be, so that when God comes to look for us, he will find us where he kept us. So we were redeemed, meaning we are purchased from that place into the place that God expects for us to be. Why is that so? Amen. Because he's no longer angry with us. The gap has been breached. So when he looks for us, he ought to find us where he kept us. Amen. Because that gap has been breached. And as a result, we have a new identity. We are justified. Because he's not angry with us. Because he finds us where he has kept us. Now he rules everything in our favor. We are justified. What does that mean? Meaning that when the accuser points an accusing finger towards us to God and say, this is your children and keeps accusing them, God still rules in our favor. We are still justified. Amen. We are still Amen. justified. Because he has no reason to be angry with us. He sees us where we need to be. So why wouldn't he rule in our favor? That is why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Meaning what? They justify those whom the, court, the judge rules in their favor. Live by faith. Meaning you have to believe it so. It is not by what you have done. It is what Jesus has done. So when we talk about properly discerning the blood of Jesus, what are we saying? Jesus, Jesus, because of the blood, the judge, God himself rules in my favor. So irrespective of the accusations, even in our consciences, we choose not to bow to that because something greater is speaking on our behalf. There is an advocate that is speaking on our behalf. We are no longer captivity, uh, cap we are no longer held captive by sin. We have been redeemed because of the blood. He purchased us from the hand of the enemy and placed us where we ought to be because of the blood. There is nothing you can do by yourself to, to make this a reality. And when you hold it, you say, Father, you're no longer angry with me. You never will be. And there is nothing I can do to make it otherwise. Amen. It's a done deal. 
Amen. So Amen. The, now we can get into the notes and just read you understand that from the chat. Now, the blood of Jesus is for our justification. Justification simply means that a judge rules in your favor, that he declares you innocent. Justification is what? Free. It's free for us, but it was not free for God. It wasn't free for God. His son had to die and shed blood. Amen. Justification is the only way a guilty person can be declared innocent. And justification is by faith only. We talked about redemption. Redemption simply means payment to purchase freedom. It can mean paying for someone who has been in prison for not paying what he owes. And we were those people. Now redemption covers his debts and gets him out of prison. We are the redeemed. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You need to say, I am redeemed. It's not just, it's just not just a quotation in the Bible. It is telling you that you as a redeemed need to say so. Amen. Redemption can also mean paying a ransom to free a captive. I believe we understand that. And we talk real quickly about propitiation, which means to appease someone's anger. And we talk about the anger of God that once upon a time he was angry with us, but no longer is. The fourth thing I want to talk about the blood of Jesus, and that is all I'll talk about for the blood today, is the aspect of remission. Now we read in Matthew 26, 28 from the New King James Version, the Bible says that, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, amen. Remission simply means forgiveness, amen. Forgiveness, we have been forgiven. So as you go through life, never wonder if you had been forgiven, if you are being forgiven or if you will be, be forgiven. Beloved, Forgiveness has been taken care of. It's a done deal. It is available for, for us. Now, when we go through situations and we say that I'm going to ask God to forgive me, well, it sounds spiritual, it sounds nice, but I'm here to really bring correction to that statement. It is not that you will ask God to forgive you because it has already been done. It is better for you to say, I will re I receive forgiveness from the Lord. Because it is not when you ask God for forgiveness that he forgives you. Because Come on. forgiveness has been taken care of. It's a provision for you. It is your identity. So when you fall short in your opinion, do not say, I'll ask God to forgive me. Remember that he has forgiven you. Receive the forgiveness. And what you should do is don't go back to your old ways. Because forgiveness has been made available just amen. like redemption, just like the atonement, just like your justification. Amen. It is already a provision from the cross. Amen. 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 So verse 26, verse by verse, we are going. It says from the NIV version that for us, Often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he, he comes. The Amplified Classic says, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are, number one, representing, number two, signifying, number three, proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. So when let, let's speak to the second part of this uh, verse 26, be the aspect of uh, proclaiming, then we'll come back to the first part. Now, when um, you proclaim, what you're simply doing is that you are um, making a declaration, you're, you're preaching because the, 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 the Greek word that was used there is katalego. It's, it, it means that, or katagelo, <laughs> it means that you're preaching, you're proclaiming meaning that in your action of breaking the bread and eating and drinking of discerning both and drinking the, of the cup, what you're doing is that you're proclaiming death, the death of Jesus until he comes. Now realize that you're not saying too much. You could just be there just discerning in your mind. You're not even saying too much, but the forces around you can reckon with what you're doing. The devil knows where he was touched. He knows that when Jesus died and resurrected, he was, he was done. He, the devil, was done. So he's working tirelessly to make sure that he carries as many people to hell with him. 
Amen. And you don't want to be part of his crew. Amen. Amen. When you partake of this, even without saying a word, you're communicating to forces, you're preaching to principalities and powers that you know what? I serve a savior, a risen Christ. He overcame death, he overcame sin, death, and the grave. He is risen, he is alive, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And by me, partaking of this i'm agreeing with him you cannot celebrate death if you, if the person never lived amen it is because he lived that is why we are celebrating his death so in the process of celebrating his death you are acknowledging his life in the process amen so the bible says that when you do this often you proclaim the lord's death till he returns the question to you and i is how often do you want to make the devil know that jesus is on your side as often as you determine to make him know that's how often you partake of this amen it says for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes what is the message? Jesus lived, he died, he resurrected. Who is your audience in the absence of no one but yourself? The principalities and powers around you. The devil knows and he does not like it. And uh, I would like to make him upset more often because of Jesus. I don't know about you. Amen. <laughs> I'm so passionate about taking communion because I get to declare and proclaim and announce and preach and celebrate and herald a message to the devil that I serve a risen king. Amen. Like I said, the Greek word there for your interest is the word katagelo, which means um, to declare openly, to announce, preach, celebrate, herald. Amen. So as you partake of it, that is what you're doing. This is a situation where you say actions speak louder than words. Amen. You're basically saying nothing, but it is preaching a message to the to principalities and powers because they do understand it very well. Now, the first portion of that scripture said, as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you do so in remembrance of me. And then it says, every time you, do, you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Amen. So we'll talk about the aspect of proclaiming his death until he returns. Why not talk about the aspect of as often as you it was amazing when the Lord opened my eyes to this reality. He said, it is as often as you, not as often as another person. What does that mean? He began to tell me that you cannot partake of the Lord's Supper for another person because it is as often as you do it, but you can partake as the other person. And I'll explain. The reason Amen. is because um, communion, the Lord's Supper is an intercessory tool. It's an intercessory tool, and I'll explain even more. You know, in order for you to intercede, if you call yourself an intercessor, what you're simply saying is that you're standing in the gap as that person. You're not standing for them. Meaning that if somebody say, pray for me, I have cancer, for example. When you go to the Lord, you're not saying, Father, I'm praying for Sister A, B, and C because they have cancer. You're coming to the Lord as the person who carries the cancer. And you're praying like that person will pray if they were in their midst. Because until you get to feel the pain of the person, you will not understand where they are. Amen. Intercessors know this better. You pray for the Lord's Supper as a sick person or whatever, whichever person you're praying for, but not for them. This is true throughout scripture. In order for Jesus to have paid this price, the Bible says he became sin. Who knew no sin? He became, we see the aspect of intercession. He became what he wanted to deal with. He became sin. Who knew no sin? He became it. That is intercession. Until you stand and become that person, you cannot truly do what you ought to do. If we are quite familiar with um, the story of Nabal, um, the conflict he had with King David and how Abigail had to come and intervene for her husband, Nabal. Amazingly, last night I read this and it just spoke to this aspect of intercession. I just wanna read two scripture, two verses from 1 Samuel 25. Verse 24, when um, Abigail came to intervene for her husband, Nabal, standing before David, she said something that speaks to intercession. 
The Bible says in 1 Samuel 25, verse 24, that she fell at his feet, at David's feet, and said, I accept all the blame in this matter. Her husband had misbehaved, but she came and took the blame. She told David that, you know what, I accept the blame in this matter. Please forgive me if I have, if I have uh, offended you in any way. Truth be told, Abigail had not offended David. Nabal had offended David. But when Abigail came to intercede, she interceded as Nabal. She did not intercede for Nabal. She amen, amen. Nabal. So when Jesus Christ had to take care of the fall of man, he became as man. He dwelt on the earth. So you realize that the life of Jesus is a lifestyle of intercession. He had to be us, feel like us, do like us, cry like us, thirst like us, so that he could understand man. And by so doing, he could properly die for man because he understood the pain of man. Amen. So the Lord says that as often as you, so if you have a child or a parent or a, 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 somebody who is connected to you who has a problem and you want to partake of the Lord's Supper, but they are in a position where they cannot, I want you to stand as an intercessor, use your intercessory tool, intervene as that person, not for them, as become that person in that time frame when you're praying and you'll see the results in Jesus' name. The Bible says in verse 24 through 26, this is where we see the principle. And when he had given thanks, he took it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, he says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. So communion, besides it being a warfare tool, like we saw in the aspect of betrayal, it is also an intercessory tool. Two verses to go and we'll be done. Lessons from verse 28. Let's look at verse 28. What does it say? So Paul said all of those things, those are the things he received from the Lord. He's correcting the church. Then he says, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. I want us to really think about that scripture. The King James Version says that whoever, whosoever, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, this is a, is, it, a scripture of contro great controversy, and we really want to correct some misconceptions today. Because quite often when we read this portion of scripture, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning. Quite often we think that the unworthiness, the unworthy manner, manner or unworthily speaks to the person. But look at it again, it speaks to the action. It speaks to the action. The unworthiness here speaks to the action, not the person. It says whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner Meaning that there is a way that I can eat this thing unworthily, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I am unworthy. My actions show unworthiness because I have not properly understood. That is in situations, this is greatly applied where, where um, abuse is pre prevalent, amen? Where abuse is prevalent is because we have not come to a place where we understand a use of a thing, so we abnormally use it. So in other words, Paul was saying that we abuse the Lord's Supper when we do not know how to partake of it. He's not necessarily saying that we are the unworthy people, but our actions show unworthiness. Amen. 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 So now look at this. We're correcting a misconception that has stopped many from partaking of this joyfully. The Bible says that um, whoever partakes of it does so in an unworthy manner. Now, here I said the 
being the unworthy manner or unworthily describes the action of eating and drinking. It is not describing the person who is eating and drinking. It's very important. What does that mean? It means that you, you do not necessarily have to be perfect before you partake of the Lord's Supper. Amen. It's because you are imperfect, that is why you need to partake of it. There is no um, amount of confession that you will do that will qualify you for what Jesus Christ has done. None. You are justified by faith. You have been redeemed by faith. God is no longer angry with you by faith. Forgiveness is a done deal for you by faith. Amen. It is because you are Amen. unworthy. That is why you must partake of this. This is what justifies you. Justifies you. Amen. So, because you feel unworthy or need to confess your sins it's a great misconception and it's a trick from the enemy to keep us away from what rightfully belongs to you the question i have for all of us is that did jesus christ die for you did he did he shed his blood for you if your answer is yes then you can partake of the lord's supper amen was his body beaten so that you can be made whole? If the answer is yes, then you are worthy to partake of this because your worthiness is based on this. Amen. So everyone who comes to the Lord's table is actually unworthy and is made worthy only through his blood. Amen. Now, now what does it, here yeah, I said what it means to partake in an unworthy manner or unworthily. I think we've talked about that, but I'll just read through this real quickly. To partake in an unworthy manner or unworthily is to not properly examine yourselves. What do I mean by that? To have a proper perspective of your identity in Christ and the reason why um, it is right for you to partake. Meaning that you get to a place where you condemn yourself and you say, oh, I'm not worthy of this. I will not take it. But that is so wrong. You have to examine yourself instead to see how well you know this. So that if you do not know it, you learn like we are all learning here so that you can partake of it. Amen. To so not learn and distinguish with understanding the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That is why we keep saying that let's discern before we partake. Otherwise, it becomes another snack for you. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says, look at this. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Every, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Amen. Now, when the Bible says that, um, that whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning. If you look at multiple translations and even the Greek translation, okay, the word sinning there is like the word profaning. So if you eat of this and drink of this without properly discerning, you're profaning, you're profaning against the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And I Let's read from a translation that will help drive the point through. Worsley New Testament translation says this. So that whosoever eateth this bread or drinketh of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. What does it mean to profane? To profane is to treat something sacred with disrespect and irreverence. That's the aspect of sin that they are talking about. So if you do this casually without understanding, you have treated something that is sacred with disrespect and irreverence, and you will not benefit. Just like the, the anointing that you disrespect, you never benefit from, so too is this. Amen. Amen. Now, coming back here, um, the solution to not partake of this in an unworthy manner, the solution is to examine yourself in verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Many people will read that in isolation and say, oh, the Bible says we need to examine ourselves. I've examined myself and I realize that there is sin in me, so I will not, I will not partake. Wrong, 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 wrong. Let's read the scriptures in context 
understand them in context that we can properly apply. So today we've taken time to just demystify you know, reasons why you should not partake because you feel unworthy. You have gotten, I believe we have all gotten to a place where we totally understand or enough to partake of the body and the blood with correct discern, discerning, amen. amen. So that as you hold that bread in your hand, you're examining yourself. What do I know about the bread? What do I know about the cup? How is it of benefit to me? That is examining yourself. You examine yourself to see how much you know about what Jesus Christ did um, concerning the price that he paid for you. Amen. Amen. So we've talked about this already. Now, what are we saying after all of this talk? We said that, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Next time when a priest or you or anybody holds the bread and they keep and they quote this, it will not just be a scripture, it will be something that you have understanding. That when you're being betrayed, you can use this as an as, as a warfare tool. You know, when you are the betrayer, you can also take bread to correct yourself. He says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, you know that you have to give thanks because you need to acknowledge the source. And you know that you need to break it as a fulfillment of prophecy as well. And because Jesus did it, and he says that this is my body, which is, sorry, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance from, of me. You know that you can use this to correct memory problems. Your neurophysiological being can be rejuvenated because of the communion. Then verse 25, in the same way, after supper, you begin to think of lifestyle. He took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Why new covenant? Because there was an old covenant and we have spoken extensively about the benefits of the new covenant. In it, you have forgiveness, justification, redemption, and propitiation. Amen. He says, whenever you drink it, you do so in remembrance of him, meaning that no one can eat of it for you. No one can drink of it for you but you can do so for someone else. Amen. You can stand in the gap for someone else, just like Jesus stood for us. He became man as us, died as us, so that we will not have to go through what he went through. Then verse 26, as we round up, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. You proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. What does it mean to proclaim? It means to herald, to preach, to, to declare. So in a very silent but powerful way, you're declaring that Jesus Christ lived, he died, and he resurrected. And there is power. Amen. And this is the way to keep the enemy away when you proclaim the death of Jesus Christ continually. Then we moved on to 27. So then whoever eats the bread of or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, meaning the manner of unworthiness is bread and wine related, not person related, amen. So never keep yourself away from that table because you feel unworthy. It is the manner that you do it, not you, amen. You'll be guilty of sinning, meaning guilty of profaning the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we amen. said the way to correct it is to examine yourself. And you examine yourself not onto negativity, but onto positivity, meaning you're asking yourself that Mildred, what do I know about the body? What do I know about the blood? When I get to a place where I can properly discern, then I have properly examined myself. Amen. 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 We are done. <laughs> so, Praise God. Praise God. So our assignments, please, I'm not just trying to be a teacher giving assignments, okay, that this is how the Lord has led in this series. So you may not do it and think you're despising it, but it is the Lord you're despising. The Bible says that we need to be obedient, amen? amen? So God may not necessarily shout from heaven and say, do assignments, but he will use vessels to say so. Please, if you have not listened to part one of the series, I would like you to do listen to it, part one, and listen to part two. Again, even though you have heard, I want you to hear again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing, amen? Now, I'll still say that every day this week, partake of the Lord's Supper. Do you want to be whole? It is your choice. Yes. Now I understand why Jesus Christ will ask somebody who has been so sick, do you want to be made whole? 
I ask you the same question like Jesus, do you want to be made whole, partake of the Lord's Supper? It is your tool and your breakthrough for this season. Amen. Amen. And as you do, I ask that you properly discern the body and the blood. Today we have done both. The next time you hold both in your hand, you'll be able to properly discern. And by so doing, you're examining yourself properly. And by so doing, you're not staying away from the table because it is the manner that you take it that matters, not you. It is because you're unworthy. That is why you have to partake of it. Amen. You cannot become worthy before you take this. Justification is by faith for all. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Mome Midred, for sharing. We do appreciate you very much. Uh, like you all know, it will be a pleasure for us to listen to or hear what you have to say about the preaching today. Please, everyone should say something. This was really powerful, and my household and I have been blessed. I trust you all have been blessed, so let's talk. So I'll say this definitely spoke to me, definitely, definitely spoke to me. Another confirmation of, um, you know, just making sure that um, you know exactly why you're taking the communion. Um, I just really didn't understand it before in depth why I was doing it. Like I said, um, last Sunday in church um, and just doing it every week. And I've even come across people saying they were taking it um, or weren't taking it, let's say, because they didn't feel like they were clean enough. They, you know, their sins were so overwhelming and realizing now that, you know, that's a trick and a lie from the enemy, feeling like we're not good enough or we're not worthy enough. But yet it's through his grace, it's through his act that we are as long as we believe so knowing and accepting this now I mean it just it just adds so much depth into you know me continuing to to do this faithfully so I really thank you for this teaching it's really helpful yeah I have one more thing to add amen amen yeah. So another way that we can partake unworthily um, based on my understanding of scripture and everything that has been said is to, is to try to um, eat of the body and drink of the blood and attempt to fill your stomach. That's another unworthy way to partake of it. Like you're eating like you're trying to fill up your stomach and that's satisfied. That's so unworthy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's what it well, uh, oh. one, um, one special thing I got from the whole message about it was um, there are some times that, especially nowadays, so, so, so many people, when they do something that is not right before God, <clears throat> they, they, they tend to, to drift away from God a lot. And I'm going to put it like, for example, like for me, let me use myself as an example for that. That sometimes when I do something that is not pleasing for God, it takes me like a whole while. Like, especially if it's something that I'm I'm really facing a little bit of challenge with, it. something that I do it over and over, and I keep on I keep on asking God, I hey God, forgive me for that, forgive me for that. And I notice that probably let's say if I'm doing the stuff, probably let's say if I'm doing the thing like let's say if I used to do it like probably like let's say ten times in a month. I notice myself that I'm dropping like five times. I'm doing it like five times and I just keep on improving like that. Sometimes you just it was just taking me like a whole while to like really come back to God's presence and say, hey God, I know that I did something wrong and I'm here again. Hey, um, I'm really sorry about that. But today what Auntie Me was saying, I really noticed that it's like it's like something that is like a privilege for us. It's like that atmosphere that each time that we'll do something that is not right before God the devil makes it seem like as if wow we like it will drifted away from god to totally like completely so i think that was one thing that i really like really 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 understood and i was really pleased hearing that because so many people today when they do something they feel like 
they are just totally out of God's presence, which that's not the case. When you notice that you're out of your track, you need to, first of all, know, um, realize yourself and come back into God's presence. And I think things are just going to keep moving on smoothly. You're just doing the right thing. You're just serving God and just know what you're doing, know when what, when what, what you do is in the right thing and you get back on track. I just feel like that's 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 how God is just gonna keep pushing, and you're just gonna improve. You're just gonna improve on yourself, especially on your difficulties and your challenges. And yeah, that's it. And I re- I really I really love the the preaching of today. Thank you, yeah. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, man. Thanks. Yeah. Kingsley, haven't heard from you for a while. I'd like to hear from you today. Brad Kingsley in the line. Yes, sir. Sorry, I was um talking to my daughter. So um actually, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Mommy Midred, for this teaching. There's so many things that um I still corrected for, actually, with the fact that um we I for one, I always I for one, I always have to when I have to sing, I don't take communion or I don't partake in the Lord's Supper when I go to church because I have to wait until when I go see the priest and go through the confession. Then that's when I have to go now and partake. But this teaching starting last week and today has actually made me get more understanding that that's really not the case, you know. And also um, interceding for someone also, when you talked about that part, to become that person, I didn't really think of it that way. So the teaching of today really gave me more clarity on to how to intercede for someone. You have to actually become that person, just like Jesus became sin, even though he knew no sin. So we actually have to become that person to be able to intercede for them. So um, that was really powerful. And those two things are what I actually that's like a, a take home message for me today. Thank you guys so much again. And, uh, God bless you. Amen. Amen. I wanted to say one more thing. I, I don't know if I emphasize this during the teaching. You know, we are both, we are all deserving of the body and blood of Jesus. So when you go to places and uh, the priest drinks the blood for you and then gives you the bread, it's the problem, okay? It's a problem because it's as often as you eat and you drink. You are deserving of the blood like the priest who is drinking that blood. So as they give you the bread, make sure you receive the cup too. They go together. A body was broken, blood was shed, and you deserve it. No one should drink the blood for you and give you the bread. I just thought I should really emphasize that. That's right. And that's true too. Most cases, we just partake in the bread and we don't partake in the Yes, sometimes they, they give you the blood too, but uh, they partake the blood in one cup as they sanctify it by drinking it first and then give it to everybody else one by one, the same cup. Mm-hmm. And I always wonder, I mean, <laughs> come on. We're living in a day to day. I wonder if they're still doing that during coronavirus. But I never thought that was something that's not what Jesus meant to do. Anyway, thank you, pastors, for your ongoing willingness to receive the revelation. And I thank God every time I come on the line, no matter how I perceive something, And every time I hear the new teaching about it, it brings something else, refreshment to my soul, how I should, how I see things on another angle. I thank you and I pray that the Lord continue to work with you because by working with you, he's definitely working through me as well. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you too. Amen, amen. Amen.
Um, I want to I want to uh, say a note, um, something on this uh, teaching. It was it was powerful. It was powerful. Um, enjoyed every moment of it. And not only are um, what you mentioned about how the manner in which we receive the communion, how important that is. Um, as you were speaking, what came to me also is when we when we eat our natural food that we're eating, right? Romans chapter 14, verse six says, he that regarded the, the day regarded it unto the Lord. Even the day God thinks of as being important, the way we, we honor it or how we look at it. He said, and he that regarded not the day to the Lord, he do it not regard it. He that eateth, eateth unto the Lord. So when we pray over our food, we're giving God thanks. We're we are giving him the reverence like we're doing uh, when, we're, when we're taking communion, how we regard it. I think that was just so powerful. And, and, um, and I just appreciate you guys. I appreciate your time of study. I appreciate um, your availability so that the Holy Spirit can lead and guide you. I appreciate you both. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Uh, this is Clive, uh, Sister Mildred. I want to thank you for the wonderful preaching. Actually, you've changed my perception about uh, the Lord's Supper. Because initially, I had this perception of fact that if I should do something which is not righteous, I should abstain from the Lord's Supper. But I've had a complete different meaning from that. I say thank you. Bless you. Amen. Thank, you. thank you, Clive. Amen. Thank you. I'm glad you're a part of the service today. Thank you, brother. Come. Thank you. Any other person before we close the service? From next week, I'll start calling names. <laughs> We are about 23 on the line today, and we've heard just from four or five people. So next week, be ready, because I'll just call names randomly. <laughs> so if there's no one else, then maybe um, Uncle Nadike can just lead us in the Lord's Supper. And as we close, if there's no one else, that's right. Okay. Get your tools for the Lord's Supper. <laughs> yes, sir. As Clive, you're not here last week, so uh, uh, just you can get anything, bread and water. And when the pray, it's going to be made. All right. So, yeah, you can just get your bread and water. Mm -hmm. All right. And that will be our tradition every Sunday. Amen. I think of the Lord's Supper. This month we plan to do, we're doing it at the end because we're building understanding. Beginning next month, I believe we must have had some understanding to start taking it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that we Amen. can take him in the breaking. Yes. <laughs> we take, him, take it before, then we share the word. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, if we have uh, the bread, let us just lift it up and we participate in the service as we see from First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, 24 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you, unto you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Father, we thank you for your son, whom you sent to die for us. We thank you, Father, for all that he went through so that we will be made whole 
so that we will not suffer pain, so that we will live life and live it to the full. And today we participate together as a family to break bread in remembrance of him until he comes again. We broke this bread so that our memories shall remain sharp and we'll remember everything that has been shared here this day so that we can practice it and it will become part of our lives. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's partake the body. As we lift up the cup of redemption, We say being justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So many promises of the Lord in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Daddy, we lift up the cup and we say thank you for your son whom you sent so that by his dying, we will live in you. We thank you because by his dying, we have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, because by his dying, we can now call you Abba, Father. So that in this day, we partake of this blood, we remember Christ until he comes again. And we know that as we do this, our lives also shall reflect him wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's partake. Holy Father, you invited us to come into your presence. And we know, O oh Lord, that you have blessed us abundantly because we have come. We pray for the grace to not just receive as others transmit information to us, but may we receive from you as people who have partnered with you. And because of that, we have become friends to whom you can entrust deep revelation of the mysteries of the kingdom. We just thank you, Lord, for this special invitation. And we trust in you that we'll walk with that understanding in our lives. This, uh, Dr. Jones, will you just um, bless us as we end the service? And yeah. I, we've been blessed. We've definitely be, been blessed by this teaching that uh, Dr. Milton has, has given us today. Thank God for her. Thank God for you. Thank God for everyone that's in the ministry that's that's doing their part. Everybody's playing a part in the in the in this ministry and in, in allowing and in order for this ministry to become successful like it, it, like it is. It's becoming successful because people's lives are being changed in a positive manner. And we thank God for that. Amen. So, amen. amen. Thank God for Jesus. Thank you for your persistence and thank you for your tenacity. Amen. Thank God amen. for every person that, that takes on the, the, the task at hand uh, to do what needs to be done without complaint, without whining <laughs> we thank god for jesus lord we thank you for everything that has been said on today we thank you lord that we have well received what has been taught unto us and we thank you for it right now in the name of jesus and we thank you lord for anointing each and every heart afresh in the name of jesus thank you for revelation knowledge lord thank you for increased 
in our in our enlightenment of your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you that the word of God has been hidden for us and not from us. In the name of Jesus, like you said in your word, you said that the mysteries of the kingdom had been hid has been hidden for us and not from us. And we thank you, Lord, as we endeavor continue in your word and we continue in your ways, Lord, that you will continue to bless us and take us to the next step, the next level in our in our walk with you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, Amen. we'll be careful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise because it belongs to you. In yes. Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.